there's a lot going on in this market. Fertilizer prices are at historic highs. How is this impacting the markets that we're seeing and food security overall? Yeah, no, it's uh, something that obviously we're focused on daily here at Nutrien. And really, you know, coming out of COVID, like so many industries, we were experiencing some supply chain challenges across crop inputs, you know, fertilizer, chemistry, seed. And, you know, those are pretty important uh, ingredients for food and food security. But now with this conflict in Ukraine, it's just exacerbated a number of challenges, starting with food itself. Uh, obviously, Ukraine is one of the breadbaskets of the world and combined Ukraine and Russia export some pretty significant commodities, including barley, wheat, soybeans, um, sunflower oil. I mean, the, you can just go across just about every ag commodity and you know that region is, is a big producer. So now with some challenged exports, um, you know, be it through the port of Odessa or even coming out of Russia, given some of the sanctions that have been put in place, uh, making logistics challenged, you know, we're seeing some of those impacts in the import markets that receive commodities from that part of the world. You know, how this plays out going forward remains to be seen in terms of getting this crop off in Ukraine, getting the next one in. But, you know, given that it's a bit of a, a war torn place, uh, we think it's going to be challenged. So that's one. Um, then, then moving on to crop nutrients themselves. Um, between Belarus and Russia, those two parts of the world produce 40% of the world's potash. And as you know, potash is uh, one of the three crop nutrients that uh, really needed to improve yields and improve disease resistance and quality of the crop. And so 40% is a huge number. Uh, and we have seen challenges uh, getting potash out of Russia and certainly out of Belarus. I mean, since the Ukraine broke, uh, the conflict in Ukraine broke out. The Russians have had export challenges. Um, you know, at, at the time that it broke out, we thought that it might be 25 to 50 percent of volumes out of Russia would be challenged, and certainly it's in that range today. Similarly, in Belarus, I mean, those sanctions were in place prior to the conflict, and it's really some of the challenges that uh, the West was having with leadership in in Belarus. And so, you know, at the time that this conflict broke out. We thought it would make matters worse for Belarus, and <clears throat> sure enough, um, we were saying one third to two thirds of volumes out of that country would be constrained, and it, again, it's in that range. So, for a part of the world that again produces a lot of potash, you know, this is a challenge for food security. But it doesn't stop there. <clears throat> if I go to nitrogen markets, Russia produces, you know, close to twenty percent of the world's nitrogen. But in addition to that, the European plants, um, the nitrogen plants, rely on Russian natural gas as feedstock. And of course, we all know what's happening with natural gas prices in Europe, given uh, the reliance on Russian gas. And so what we are seeing is that those European plants are no longer economic and, in fact, shutting in. And that's, uh, again, uh, creating some real problems in the nitrogen market. And... Um, and we see the reaction in price. And then finally, the third crop nutrient phosphate. Again, the Russians are big producers. And again, there's supply chain and logistics challenges given, given um, sanctions. And so you, know, you go across the crop nutrients and then you go across the food that um, the ag commodities that Ukraine and Russia produce. And while we're maybe not feeling those impacts today, just because, um, you know, the crop nutrients that are going to ground were procured prior to this conflict. We expect that if this goes on, and we expect it will drag on, that there will be uh, ongoing food security challenges. I mean, given all of this upheaval, how is Nutrien addressing sustainability, thinking about, uh, I guess, being involved in just global food security? Yeah, no, that's um, certainly also a discussion that we're having on a daily basis because it would have the appearance potentially of needing to abuse our sustainability objectives to shore up food security on the planet. And in fact, we don't see it that way. We see that some of our sustainability efforts, in fact, will improve yields and improve outcomes on, <clears throat> on food security. And so the best example I have is the work that we're doing on our, we call it our, um, our carbon pilot. And that's, we're, we're conducting that across three provinces in Canada and 15 states in the US and signing up 
225,000 acres last year, and we expect to triple that this year, where we're actually on the acre with the farmer. I mean, through our retail uh, network, we have about 3,900 crop consultants and agronomists working with growers daily. And through our carbon pilot, working with growers on the best whole acre solutions from a sustainability point of view, but from a yield point of view as well. So how do we go about that? Well, one is we enable our agronomists digitally so that they have all of the best information and best solutions for that acre, depending on soil sampling. And you know, we have our own labs to assay soil and assess soil and crop nutrients in soil and biomass and, and water outcomes, all those uh, on and on and on. Understanding digitally, given the soil condition, what is the best solution for the grower and then working with the grower on um, even deploying some of our own proprietary products like a slow release nitrogen that we uh, that we produce that you know the nitrogen goes on the soil release it given a, its polymer coating releases slowly into the plant so that the plant can maximize uptake of that nitrogen and we have less nitrogen being released to the atmosphere which of course is a source of greenhouse gases but beyond that you know working on on cover cropping and sequestration in the soil Again, working on best water outcomes, working on biodiversity in the soil, and that we find when we when we provide those whole acre solutions, that we in fact can improve again yield outcomes for the grower and financial outcomes for the grower while meeting sustainability targets. We've set a target for ourselves of reducing our scope one and scope two emissions by 30 percent by 2030. Um, from a 2018 baseline, and, and we believe that that's achievable given, given what we're seeing on the acre, and for us, that's quite exciting. You know, we're working on um, for our stewardship, so as it relates to crop nutrients, that's, again, soil sampling, understanding what the soil needs from a crop nutrient point of view, and then, and then um, using variable rate technology to lay down only what the soil needs. So when I say for our, that's right crop nutrient, right place, right time and right quantity. So across, you know, these sustainability outcomes, you know, we're finding that, that again, we can improve yields, um, we can improve outcomes for the grower, we can improve outcomes for food uh, insecurity, and we can, we can achieve sustainability objectives. That's, that's our on our on acre work. We're also looking to um, decarbonize our nitrogen network. From a scope one, scope two point of view, uh, we're just looking at building a low carbon ammonia plant in our Geismar facility in uh, in Louisiana. That would be about a 1.2 million ton nitrogen plant that would use some new technology that would allow us to capture and sequester over 95% of the carbon that's uh, released through that process. Um, we're doing a lot of work in our potash business unit, looking at uh, deploying renewables, wind and solar at our mine sites and also co-gen facilities at our mine site. So, Jen, I think it's fair to say, say scope one, scope two, for what you know we do here at Nutrien and scope three, working with the growers and partners in this industry for those whole acre solutions. You know, again, we're looking to re uh, improve our overall outcome in terms of greenhouse gases, but again, water, biodiversity, and at the same time, um, conquer these food insecurity challenges. Are you guys thinking about what's going to get growers, farmers around the world to get their yields up? Um, you know, the world needs to grow more food by 2050. I guess have all the gains and yields already been had, or is there going to be new technology, a new way to be able to extract more production while also meeting, you know, emissions reduction targets? Yeah, I think it's fair to say there's going to have to be innovation and uh, creativity and new technologies that are going to increase food production. You know, by 2050, we're going to need to um, feed 10 billion people. And so in order to tackle the food security challenges on the planet today and then feed, um, you know, a growing population by 2050, we're going to have to double food production from today. And certainly... The amount of arable land that's available to us is not going to double. In fact, it's going to go up incrementally. And so we need to look at our existing footprint on the planet to feed the world. And, and again, that's going to come through technology and innovation, of which there's already been significant gains. I mean, if you look at, we've seen examples of, uh, for example, 
examples of corn yields that are 600 bushels an acre. And that's three times what the U.S. average is for corn. And so we know that it's possible. Um, and we know that we can deploy technologies. You know, there's been innovations in seed and germplasms. There's certainly been innovations in chemistry, crop chemistry, and, and innovations in, uh, as we were just talking about, innovations in crop nutrients as well, where, you know, we, we get, again, we get on the acre with the grower um, and our crop uh, consultants and our agronomists. And we're finding, with, again, with a digitally enabled agronomist that we can get on that acre and talk about some of these uh, recipes and scripting to improve those yield outcomes on the acre. And again, deploy you know, the appropriate seeds and there are, we have some of our even proprietary seed technology now, making sure again that we're deploying crop nutrients properly and, and the appropriate chemistries where we can improve yields. And yeah, I, again, I think that um, we're going to see more innovation as we seek to feed a growing world and, and achieve these sustainability outcomes. And, for us, you know, at Nutrient, this is what we do. This is at the heart of what we do across uh, our neat retail network on the farm with the grower, but then backed by the largest network of crop nutrient production in the world and our integrated model that allows us to be on the acre, but then reach right through that value chain. I keep saying all the way back to, you know, underground at one of our potash mines here in Saskatchewan. And from a sustainability perspective and a yield perspective, uh, we're seeking to optimize those outcomes. And I mean, how big a role could something like alternative fertilizer play? Is that something that Nutrient's looking at? Or I guess, how are you thinking about this? Yeah, it, and certainly those technologies are evolving as well, Jen. Um, and it can play a, a significant role. And certainly it's a growing role today where we look at these biological solutions uh, you know, and certainly as it relates to nitrogen fixation in the plant and deploying microbial technology, um, you know, that from a sustainability point of view, again, you know, if it's a biological solution, um, you know, the outcomes can be improved there, but also just nutrient uh, efficiency, nutrient use efficiency in the plant. And today, um, you know, we would say nutrient, we have some of those products, but certainly as we look at our portfolio, and the direction of biologicals into the future, we expect that that will grow for the industry and we expect that that will grow for nutrients so that we have that offering among, you know, this huge offering that we have today, be it um, our own proprietary products, provision of crop nutrients, now biologicals, digitally enabled, uh, even, even providing financing solutions today to the growers. So yeah, Jen, I think it's fair to say that we believe that that will be an important component of our suite of offerings to the grower. I guess, what do you think is the biggest challenge for food security kind of looking ahead, if you could? Is it just extreme weather? Is it um, just the challenge of extracting more production out of existing land? What's, what's the biggest challenge or threat? Yeah, I, you know, I think that um, certainly the pace of technology needs to move along with, as I was, we were talking about earlier, a growing population. And uh, we, need to, we need to stay focused on that. But at the same time, as we've been discussing, improving those sustainability outcomes, I think, Jen, the one you point out, a clean, changing climate is certainly a challenge where we're not now just looking at uh, only improved traditional views of improved yields on the acre, but rather adaptation and what crops are going to be able to grow where as the climate changes. And, you know, again, looking out to 2050 and growing food production um, for a growing population while adapting to climate change. I mean, these are going to be some real challenges. But again, I would say for Nutrien, this is at the heart of what we do. Um, we're certainly working on this on a daily basis. And, and uh, we believe at Nutrien, you know, given a platform like ours that that these challenges can be met. 